Yes, it's Free Speech Friday time again. That's our catchy soul bossa nova tune for Free Speech Fridays. And we got a great little, a new, a new pairing today. From the ACT Party, we welcome to Free Speech Fridays, MP, ACTlist MP, Brooke Van Velden. Brooke, nice to have you with us. Oh, good morning, Sean. It's great to be here. All right, now, are you the, are you the deputy leader too? I am indeed. Okay, all right, we'll call you deputy leader of the ACT Party. It sounds more important, doesn't it? Oh, that's all right. You can just call me Brooke. Okay, you're just Brooke. And also joining us, a regular on Free Speech Fridays, the man who would have been mayor, but then wasn't, um, former former host with the most at HQ, and he's got a new venue coming in at the Viaduct uh, early next year. Um, outspoken and a good good geezer all round, Leo Malloy. Leo, how are you, mate? Good morning to you both. I'm very well, thank you. Bit of rain about here in Auckland this morning, but nonetheless, all happy up here. Oh, good stuff. Now, Brooke, Leo, have you met each other before? Uh, many have. occasions, I've, like um, in March, I've... remember December the 3rd, actually, Brooke. <laughs> I've, I've had the pleasure of being um, down at uh, Leo's restaurant a couple of times, a great establishment. Good, good. All right, so you know each other, you can be, you can be as open and as frank with each other as you like. Look, now I'm throwing this new... Um, topic at you. It wasn't on the list we sent you, but it's kicked off in the last 24 hours. The boot camp as a response to ram raids. We last saw this policy, I think, 2017, Bill English or John Key rolled it out. I've seen it three or four times floated or, or discussed in, in my career uh, covering uh, politics. Uh, Brooke, what do you reckon? Does it excite you, the idea of boot camps? Is this the answer to ram raiding? and youth delinquency or not? Oh, look, I, I can see why um, National Party have announced this, but, you know, I, I would really want us to be going and actually talking to people who are in the military to ask them whether or not they've even got the capacity and capability to essentially babysit kids. I mean, they've got an awful lot of work to be doing for themselves. And, um, well, you know, well, well lump, no, they're, but, they're at a loose end. Kids on them. They're not walking around hotels at the moment enforcing quarantine, are they? No, that, I think that, that's fair. But I think one, one aspect I think we've got is, you know, what are the intermediate steps that we can take before we even start talking about getting them into the military? I mean, is it the case where, you know, like the ACT Party's policy where you slap ankle bracelets on kids who are repeat ram raid offenders so you know where they are you've got gps tracking the police know where they are um, and we know um, if they're out beyond curfew times yeah um, i think that's an important point uh, but second to that i think we've got to get back into more of our charter schools model i mean before you even start talking about um, military camps you have to think about the vanguard military school I mean, that was a school that was set up and established for kids who dropped out of schools. Um, people who had not attended school for quite a while, people from really impoverished areas. And they gave kids a chance and they gave them really good male role models, people who had been ex-Navy. Um, and these kids loved attending school. And I'd like to see more school choice that allows for that sort of establishment. You know, mm. before we start thinking, how do we just keep them away from society in a military boot camp. Yeah. Leo, a lot of people in my text this morning saying it's also about the parents. Maybe the parents should go to boot camp. Uh, what do you think of the idea of youth going to boot camp and is it really a solution that's going to make much difference? Well, if you judge it based on history, it's probably not a viable solution. But nonetheless, we're faced with a very unique situation here. And I don't really quite understand what the key drivers of these core... It appears the police now say there's only about 80 key players in this ram raid market up here in Auckland. Well, who's driving the 80? Is it a gang-related issue? And if it is, is that where we start to deal with it? So I think we have to ascertain firstly, get great clarity around exactly who's... Are these kids doing this on commission? Are they doing it because of social media elements that drive it? What's exactly driving it? That's where you start. But um, I'm, not a, I'm not averse to the idea. I mean, if these kids are so determined that they want to engage in some form of gang tribalism type behaviour, well, the military's a very good tribe, in my view, a very productive one. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't be a yay or nay person until I found out precisely what's driving these 80 odd kids who are doing it. So. Yeah. Well, Brooke, you mentioned um, charter schools, uh, which, of course, were kiboshed by the current government when it came in, were part of uh, an act initiative 
uh, many years ago now, almost two decades ago, I think. Um, we do have colleges that, if you like, chart their own course, particularly in terms of religion, one of them being Bethlehem College near Tauranga, um, which seems to attract the ire or negative coverage from the woke media and the woke liberals, the latest being an, an attack on a counsellor at Bethlehem College who expressed in her own social media misgivings about the wonderful rainbow inclusiveness and the transgender activism that goes on uh, in our schools. Um, stuff had to correct and apologise for some of the stuff it published about here. But, man, the reaction to that, and certainly the reaction we, we got on the programme here was that many people are seriously concerned about the amount of rainbow activism that children in state schools are being exposed to and the age at which children are being supposedly educated about homosexuality and transgenderism. Um, do you share those concerns, Brooke? Mm, well, I mean, there's a lot there, isn't there, to unpack. But I think, you know, on the whole, why can't we just let kids be kids um, and allow them to enjoy being out in the playground and being with their friends rather than trying to get them to discuss gender identity and talk about their race and how they're different from all the other kids in the room? I think we've got some serious kind of concerns there. Primary school should be about getting the foundational building blocks so people can read and write so they can move on to that next part of school. Um, but, I mean, you know, when you talk about Bethlehem College and, and how it works with um, gender diversity in New Zealand versus some special character schools um, that have more religious um, yeah. teachings, you know, I think we do need to allow for choice. You know, there are clearly reasons why um, some parents would choose to send their kid to a school uh, because they have a particular religion. And I think we need to allow for more school choice, whether or not that's... Uh, having a religious aspect or not. And, you know, to be honest, if you send your kid to a, a strong Christian school, I think you should be able to expect that there'll be strong Christian values instilled uh, at that school. Yeah. Well, it seems to me those strong Christian values were criticised for being strong Christian values by stuff newspapers. It published accusations against this woman that simply couldn't be borne out by the facts. And it almost seemed to be trying to, and the news media do this often, mainstream media, they seem to be trying to cancel her and cancel Bethlehem College, Leo, which doesn't seem fair to me. Precisely, and, and this is a well-known Christian school, and as Brooke said, people go there for particular value systems, they send their children, and these were primary school children. Now, at that age, what comes next after this? Are they going to have them on um, puberty blockers if they want to be on puberty blockers at the age of 10 years? It's ridiculous. These kids are not in a position to contemplate or understand the context of very little about their sexuality, what it's going to evolve into or not evolve into, as the case may be. So I think it's ridiculous. I think they should allow them, as Brooke said, to be children. And this woman's a qualified psychotherapist, if I understand my Yeah, that's right. Correct. correct, yep. So she has every right to pass judgment on the curriculum that's being imposed on them. And I see now the woke media saying, oh, yes, but she was the, the school was state-funded. Well, so what? state fund doesn't mean that you have blanket control over everything a child thinks and says or the parents or advisors think or say, in my view. It's just yeah. a ridiculous example yet again yeah. of further intervention, and we're all being channeled to think in the same way. We're yeah. not allowed to think for ourselves anymore. Yeah. Hey, Brooke, I take it that charter schools and a return to, if you like, full-on charter school policy is a bottom line for ACT um, if it's negotiating to, to be part of a government or support a new government after the election? Oh, look, ch charter schools go hand-in-hand hand with the ACT party. You know, this is something that uh, we, we fundamentally believe in, you know, that, that people need more choice in the education that's provided to them. Um, and I think, especially in the case where you know and you see that private schools uh, do so well uh, because they're able to have their own forms of agenda rather than just what the state education departments decide that they should teach. Um, and I think we need to allow more kids who don't even have uh, the financial ability uh, to have more of that freedom of uh, educational choice. Um, thank you for that. Now, guys, we're going to take a quick break for 30 seconds, and when we come back, I want to talk about five waters, though Winston Peters tells me this morning it's now six waters. I cannot keep up. Let's move on to the issue that we've been making much of, and, and people we've, we've told this story to have been outraged, but 
Man, it's a bit like the Nanaima Hooter stuff. Uh, mainstream media just reluctant to step outside. I think their government co controlled agenda. Last Friday, there was a report back of the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee. It had heard uh, 88,000 submissions on the three waters reform, which give co governance and change the way water resources are administered in this country. Um, but rather than listen to any of the 88,000 submissions uh, that it received, the Labor-controlled Select Committee came back and turned three waters into five or indeed six waters and went past co-governance to giving iwi and hapu groups in the first instance the ability to set and give effect to the Treaty of Waitangi without consultation with any local bodies. The scope of this was then moved to cover all fresh waters, geothermal waters and coastal waters. So what was three waters, what was strongly opposed by m the vast majority of councils in New Zealand and farming and other lobby groups has now become five waters and we understand it will be passed most likely under urgency uh, before Christmas. Um, Brooke, if I've ever seen the Consultative Select Committee process, um, I, I cannot remember his time, I've seen that process more abused or less functional than in this instance? Oh, un under this government, the Select Committee process is just a rort. Um, you know, we are constantly having legislation that's passed through with kind of a, a light dusting of, of consultation where nobody is really listened to. And in this particular case, it's particularly bad uh, because Labour is just bulldozing through, uh, not only just with their original intent of this law, uh, but adding to it um, and, and, and making some more changes to co-governance uh, that I think most New Zealanders would have serious concern with. You know, yeah. we're not only allowing for the 50-50 iwi split um, they've now decided um, the the number of people on these committees can be as as many as you want so there'll be unwieldy huge committees that won't get anything done except that only iwi and hapu will be able to set these te mana o te wai statements uh, which will in effect uh, mean that there's far more control for iwi and hapu than anybody else on well this committee. isn't co-governance this is self ceding of sovereignty in many ways bro I think it's just wrong. Uh, I mean, we live in a liberal democracy where we believe, or at least we should believe, that it doesn't really matter what race we are or what race our ancestors were, and that we will all have the same rights and duties under the law afforded uh, to us as anybody else in our society. And this is clearly a misstep uh, where people uh, will be put in positions with power on water service entity boards uh, because of the race of their ancestors or themselves and be given more power uh, than another person on that committee. And I just don't think that's fair for what we should expect in New Zealand and I just don't think it's right. You know, we should uphold liberal democracy uh, which says that our race doesn't actually matter. Leo, do you disagree with that? Not at all, and I have great concerns about Tamana OTY, which has been around since 2014, but is not well known to most members of the community, but should be discussed openly because, in my view, it's quite a... Uh, whilst I'm not um, strictly against um, co-governance, I have great concerns when it jeopardises democracy, and Tamana OTY definitely de uh, jeopardises democracy. Mm. So I think it should be debated more, but we need a bit more comprehensive understanding of, the, of that particular... Yeah overarching piece of legislation and how it impacts on the Water Amendment Bill. Yeah, well, Leo, the problem is that, I mean, honestly, apart from the platform, you're not going to read about this report back much. It hasn't figured in mainstream media. Uh, and I personally, I just think they're letting the side down. I, I was waiting for someone else to break this story this week. Uh, we've got limited resources and I didn't get to it as fast as I thought I should, but then... I couldn't believe I hadn't seen it on One News or, or News Hub or Disney Channel um, or, or Staff or in the Herald. Um, it was this massive report back, completely at odds with all the public submissions, largely ignored by the news media and the press gallery, Brock. What the hell's going on? 
Well, you know, if, if, if you take the, the sympathetic and kind view, um, you could understand that some of the journalists are just under the pump and probably don't really understand um, what this legislation in its great detail is. Um, and then the other less sympathetic view is, well, if it is an unwieldy, huge piece of legislation that will have uh, a huge ramification for democracy going forward, we should be spending even more time trying to understand it and get to grips with it. Um, and I think that's the duty of, of what we have as parliamentarians, um, is to try and uh, decipher what the government's doing uh, and articulate it simply uh, so more people can understand. And that's what we're trying to do uh, with our pro-government uh, documents that we've released, and we're going around and talking in the public about it. Now, there is co-government being rammed down uh, through multiple uh, agencies uh, through this government, and I think we need to, to openly talk and debate about this idea uh, that we're fundamentally changing what democracy means in New Zealand and moving away from one rule and one law for all uh, and becoming fixated on who the race of your grandparents were. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we in ACT are doing. We're getting up every day and articulating this message. Yeah. Maybe it is, Leo, that journalists are too busy calling out councillors they disagree with at Christian colleges, I don't know, saying Jordan Peterson's going to collapse New Zealand society to actually do their bloody jobs. Yes, well, it's certainly a change in the landscape there with journalists. I totally agree with you there. There's, there's a certain degree of compliance with government direction and government policy that seems to me to be unhealthy. It's very seldom you get a robust uh, argument that, that opposes anything the government seems to want. But I would say this um, quite emphatically, that this next general election will be fought on the grounds of co-governance and cost of living. So whilst Labor may think they're clever pushing this legislation through now, that may well be, uh, in fact, what brings them to their knees uh, in 12 months' time. That's my view. Mm. It is a kind of a doubling down, Brooke, and I get the feeling from this administration, and let's move on to the political polls, which indicate that the tide continues to go out. I guess if you've got a majority under MMP, such a rare thing, and you've got a year to go, you're going to go for the doctor, aren't you, Brooke? You're going to do everything you can and say, damn the torpedoes. Well, I think, I think there's truth to that. I think um, the government has decided to rush through as much legislation that they think will be unpopular as quickly as they can. You know, it's not just three waters. I mean, you talk to um, Kerry Allen, the Justice Minister, um, who is imminently oh, introducing a new hate speech law. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, uh, but she's publicly said uh, that it will be introduced before Christmas and passed before uh, the next election. Now, that doesn't allow a lot of time, once again, for proper consultation about changing our democratic rights under the law. Now, I think all New Zealanders should be concerned that this government uh, is getting bought, rushed through Parliament with a lack of public consultation that will fundamentally change what it means to be a New Zealander. Yeah, Brooke, those polls that you're reading, not bad for ACT. You guys, you know, if you like, your base or what you can expect to be you, your co core vote has grown um, and you seem more solid and certainly solidly above the 5%. There's no question about that now. I guess you guys, though, would also read those political polls and because I think he's competing in some instances for the same votes that you are, you have a look at Winston and say he's kind of... You know, there may be life in the old Tusker yet. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't take too much time thinking about Winston. I'm more concerned about real New Zealanders who will actually be affected by these law changes. Um, you know, you're right. Act has solidified a lot of a lot of vote, and I think that's because uh, you know, we're articulating messages uh, that people resonate with. You know, we have cost of living crisis. Uh, blowouts, we're against co-government and we believe that there need to be more consequences for crime um, and we're actually releasing policy and public policy statements about what we would do as an alternative you know, my concern with, with Winston is I don't know what his alternative would be you know, he's more concerned about Winston first than New Zealand first, whereas I know what that stands for and what we would bring to the next government, you know, and I would just say that you know, if we end up with a national act government and act as strong, I certainly know what our agenda would be uh, to try and repeal uh, Labor's laws and what we would look for uh, for laws that would make New Zealand a more hopeful, aspirational society to live in. 
Um, but if you add Winston to that mix, you end up muddying the waters about what a true policy reform would look like uh, under a National Act government. Yeah. Leo, the nice thing about polls is it is game on. It's not all one-way traffic and there's plenty of nuance and interest there for you know people like me who are who are political train spotters, but it's telling a story of the tide going out on Labour, isn't it? And there has been a trend, a particular trend for quite some time, but having said that, these last two polls, the Roy Morgan poll was really interesting because it showed a four-point slip for National, which was a surprise to many people, but Talbot Mills, I don't take too much notice of Talbot yeah. Mills, nothing. Labour, Labour drops their poll strategically when they feel like they're losing the battle. Yeah. For the hearts and minds of the public, they throw that out there to say, look at this, but Talbot Mills do rolling polls anyway, and I think they've proved time and time again they're not accurate, so I would dismiss them. But getting back to Winston, I think the only redeeming feature from Winston's last time in government is he kept the handbrake on Labor. And I think Winston now needs to not uh, to agree that he has to define what he stands for before people can vote for him because he did betray a lot of people last time when he formed the coalition with Labor. He has to come out now and state clearly exactly where he sits politically. Is he left? Is he right? Is he centre? What does he intend to do? Who does he want to work with? That's where his weakness is, in my view. Having said that, Winston will always have a following, a cult following, of three or four percent. So he's only Shane Jones wins to North, Winston's in again. So, yeah. Um, all right, guys, we've got a couple of minutes left. Either of you going to see Jordan B. Peterson, my mate, Dr. Jordan Peterson? Brooke? Uh, I don't have any plans to do that at this stage. Um, well, if you're in knows? town Monday night, I might have a free ticket for you. Okay, I'll talk to you about <laughs> after that. Leo, you know who he is. You're going to go I certainly see know him? who he is, but my diary is very, very full at the moment, I've got to say. I, I'm in the middle of a big new exercise and I'm, I have no spare time at all. So and whilst I will be watching from afar and keenly analysing what people say about him, particularly on Twitter, yeah. I'll be seeing what they say, but I won't be in attendance. And also, guys, because it is Friday, I just want some sporting predictions from you. Um, Samoa in the league final against Australia. Who, who do you want to win and who do you think will win, Brooke? Oh, look, I mean, I've got to go with my Pacific friends in Samoa over our neighbours over in Australia. Yeah, OK, that's good. Uh, Leo, wouldn't it be great at Samoan victory? And I am totally PI. I love the South and I love the South Aucklanders. I box with them every day. They're fantastic people. And I hope they give them a bloody good hiding, which is exactly what they deserve. Exactly. All right. I'd like to see those convicts getting beaten up. I mean, I hope the All Blacks give the English a bloody good pound. <laughs> well, that was the game. other one. Really, this is the game that defines the season. It started awfully. It's been a roller coaster of a ride. They've got to, they've got to win emphatically, I would say, um, on Sunday morning, Leo, or, you know, I think we'll lose faith. Well, I love Geordie Barrett in 12. I think he's the future in 12. I'm interested they're giving that to Leah another run on the wing. That was quite surprising. Well, they did look quite useful against Scotland. But the one that disappoints me is that Samasoni is hooker. He's an awesome player, this Samasoni. What, did he get three tries against Scotland? Yeah. But he's only coming off the bench again. I don't understand why. He's so dynamic. And to me, he looks like he's the future of the, you know, playing hooker for the, in the front row. Brooke, are you a rugby checker? You're going to be getting up on Sunday morning to watch it live? Oh, look, on Sunday morning, that is a bit hard. Um, I'm not that committed to rugby, but what I am doing <laughs> is I'm, I'm busy all weekend talking to people who might support ACT. So if you're around Koe Marama on Sunday morning and you're not a rugby fan, I'm hosting a Pups in the Park event for anybody who supports ACT and also has a four-legged friend. So if you um, head on to the ACT Facebook page or any... Of other, I um, love it. You are so on started. message, Brooke. You are so on message. That is fantastic work. <laughs> I love you slotting that in at the end. Great work. Um, uh, look, Leo and Brooke, lovely talking to you both on Free Speech Fridays. That's exactly how it's meant to roll. We have a good discussion. Um, we will talk to you both again soon. Good luck with what is it, puppies in the park for politics or whatever you're doing, Brooke. Thank you both very much indeed. <laughs> uh, Leo Malloy Thank and Brooke you. Van Velden, our uh, Free Speech Fridays uh, panel.